Oh, the cat sound. Can you hear in the back? Very good. If it comes to the point you can't hear anything, then rejoice. <laughs> Silence. <coughs> So, I think everybody is who's coming. Those who aren't here, they're already enlightened, so they're taking the afternoon off. It's <laughs> my assumption. So, uh, for this afternoon's Siddha class, uh, I skip a few pages so I can talk about Nibbana through Anapanasati. <coughs> and this is basically the Anapanasati Sutta. 118. So it's on page 46. 46. Okay, so here we go. One of the reasons I like to always uh, read this out is because sometimes we think Anapanasati equals Samatha. Satipatthana equals Vipassana. But here you will find out that they're all the same. So here we go. This is... <coughs> the Buddha speaking. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it completes the four focuses of mindfulness. When the four focuses of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they complete the seven enlightenment factors. When the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they complete true knowledge and deliverance, otherwise known as enlightenment. So, the Buddha is saying this mindfulness of breathing equals satipatthana, equals development of enlightenment factors, equals enlightenment. So in other words, it's no, now you do uh, uh, anapanasati and then you do uh, satipatthana. By doing anapanasati, Mindfulness of breathing, you are at the same time doing Satipatthana. You don't switch from one to the other because doing one is doing the other. What does the Buddha mean by this? And this also gives a little bit more information about what is Anapanasati and especially the question which has been asked by a few people about when you get to you know, the delightful breath, what are you actually watching? So anyway, here we go. As usual, how, how does mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated complete the four focuses of mindfulness? When the in-breath and out-breath are long, and you are aware that they are long, when the in-breath and out-breath are short, and you are aware that they are short, when you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out, when you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out, <coughs> on those occasions you are mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energised, fully aware of the purpose of mindful. In and out breathing is regarded by the Buddha as a body, in the category of bodies. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energised, fully aware of the purpose, and mindful. So in each of these cases, those first, what we call the four stages or four steps of uh, Anapanasati, which are not steps, the first two are alternatives. Long breath, short breath. Have you ever been doing Anapanasati and you look at the breath and is that long or is that short? Actually, it's sort of in the middle somewhere. And the Buddha never teaches you to do not a long breath, but a short breath, but a middle breath. So you're not following the instructions, are you? There's nothing in here which says you should do middle breath. It's either long or short. 
I'm only being cynical because the long breath, short breath, is just an alternative. Either one or something similar will do. But in each of those cases it's called the breath. Now, for those of you who um, study these things or really hear many different teachers talking about this, sometimes again they start saying that you watch the in and out breath if they're long, watch in and out breath if they're short, and then you watch the whole body as you breathe in and out. And of course that means people think the body is a physical body. But even here in particular in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Buddha actually says specifically in and out breathing is regarded by the, the Buddha as a body. It's called the bodies. It's one of the bodies which a person is supposed to watch. So by watching the whole breath, that qualifies as you know, watching the whole body without disturbing the meditation. And of course, as I have indicated, this is what happens naturally. So, we just, we don't just uh, know the in-breath, the out-breath and then go off to watching our body, the physical body, our knees and our head and our nose. It's just we watch the whole body of the breath from beginning to end. And of course, uh, more our arguments in favour of that is that when you do the walking meditation, hopefully you've done lots of walking meditation while you're here. Because sometimes the people can get a bit dull when they just do sitting meditation all day. So that's why we have the walking meditation practice. And if you can go with walking meditation, you up for it? Me? No. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. I'll come now. Because I did the last one when I was over in, um, in, where was it, in Penang. You always know that whenever meditation goes to, or any Buddhism goes to another country, it always takes on some of the characteristics <coughs> of that country. That's why we do have American Buddhism, we have English Buddhism, we have German Buddhism, we have Chinese Buddhism, so now we have Australian Buddhism. And I made sure that we uh, adjust some of the practices to suit the culture in which Buddhism is embedded. So when we had walking meditation, I decided to Australianize it. You're the only one who knows how to do this, come on. So. <laughs> This is an interesting way to do walking meditation, which brings up a lot of energy. It's the Australian way of doing walking meditation. And I'm not exploiting Venerable Chandra because when I was in Penang, I did it. And it was, as soon as I started this, it got on YouTube. And everyone said, so, it's called... <laughs> it's called kangaroo walking meditation. So your posture, first of all. People often ask me, where should they put their hands when they're doing walking meditation? So in Australia, we put them up here. And once we're mindful, with kindness and with joy, then we don't move left foot, right foot. That's just, you know, just so boring. Because kangaroos never walk like that. We do Australian kangaroo walking meditation, which is Hop, one, mindful, <laughs> mindful, as <laughs> you hop, <laughs> and that's called kangaroo walking meditation. Thank you. <laughs> and on some of these retreats, well, sometimes people get so sort of stuffed in their head, no joy, no happiness, boring, depressed. And if anybody comes on a retreat feeling depressed, you show them walk, kangaroo walking meditation <laughs> and her depression will disappear. So, for those of you who haven't tried that yet, because you can't just judge it from a distance, you've got to see for yourself. That's what they say in Buddhism, each wise person to experience it for themselves. So I challenge you. The next time you do some walking meditation, 
try the kangaroo walk, walking meditation. It gives you a boost of energy, more mindfulness, and if you feel a bit dull and uh, it's very helpful. It's as good as a cup of tea or coffee or all the basic <laughs> stuff. It really gets you going. But anyway, that's the kangaroo walking meditation. You know what? Otherwise, you do the slow walking meditation and have all these stories about the slow walking meditation. Over in Jainagra, where I teach a lot, and that's a retreat centre opposite uh, our monastery, the people are doing the slow walking meditation, and would you lift up and you go forward and put your feet down. Really slow. And it did happen, there was a family, a very you know, devoted Buddhist, they came to see me and they just wanted to have a look at Jhana Grove, the meditation retreat centre. I said, well, if you go there, you have to be really quiet, otherwise you disturb the other people who are meditating. So I said, I promise I'll be quiet. And I had a, a couple of kids, especially one kid about seven or eight years of age. And as soon as they went over there, the kid had to come back and see me, urgently. And he was really sort of frightened. He said, what's up? And why are you so frightened? We're in a retreat centre. There are zombies over there. <laughs> the place has been invaded by zombies. Because <laughs> apparently, like zombies were really cool. First of all, there were vampires, now there's zombies. And uh, all the kids were going to see zombie movies. And apparently, zombies, that's what they do. They walk really slow. As <laughs> he really thought they were zombies that invaded the meditation retreat centre. And of course, we've had that other story. We haven't told that about uh, when Ajahn Sumedha first came to the UK. I went to um, Chithurst, and there was, I hope she's not here, otherwise I could probably get into trouble. There was uh, a lady who was a good supporter. She was the, uh, the head of the um, uh, what was it? The, um, uh, an institution not far from Chitta. She was a head psych, uh, a psycho psychiatrist at an institute for those who had uh, severe uh, emotional and psych psychological problems. And she bought a nice house in one of the villages not far from Chitta. And it was an old house which had <coughs> must have been a drought because because of the drought there's lots of cracks in the wall she got it very cheap a big house and with a stables or garage or something which she turned into a nice meditation hall lots of rooms a great place to have a retreat for the weekend so she organized a retreat for the weekend and many of the retreatants all came wearing white and they did walking meditation in the garden, the slow walking. <laughs> and if you ever know English villages, especially in places like Sussex, there's always nosy neighbours who push back the lace curtains and see what's <laughs> going on. And they knew that this was a head psychiatrist at the institution, the <laughs> hospital. <laughs> And she saw all these strange people <laughs> in white <laughs> moving up, was walking towards her. She rang the police. <laughs> she complained that the head psych had no right to bring her patients home for the weekend. <laughs> This is the danger to the village, so the police came along. I wanted to take everybody away, including Ajahn Sumedha. <laughs> <laughs> and it took a lot of discussion. And said, look, these are sort of crazy people. Are you sure? <laughs> these are Buddhists meditating. And eventually the police left them alone. So they're very, very careful. Sometimes a slow walking meditation can get you into trouble. <laughs> but it's nice if it's a place like this, it's natural. Anyway, uh, where are we? Oh yeah, when you, this is the first four steps, that you're watching the breath, the breath is your object of meditation, and that counts as part of the body, and you're experiencing it through touch, through that 
fifth sense, the body. So it's the body, and the body is known to the body sense. The fifth sense, touch, sensation. And that's why it calls it body. So when you're watching the breath even, that counts. That is mindfulness of the body. Why? It's also because the whole purpose of mindfulness of the body and all the different types of mindfulness of the body which you, uh, I, I read out uh, uh, in the previous, or one before, um, Word of the Buddha class. It's all got a purpose to it. The purpose is to be able to let go of the body. So it's just the body, not me, not mine, not the self, impermanent. We let go of that body so that we can actually go into the mind. So this is actually why we have those ten benefits, which I was talking about yesterday, with all of the psychic stuff, with the, um, the jhanas. You do that in order to not be so stuck in this body, so I can let it go and go into the world of the mind. So that's why the mindfulness of the body is important. It allows you to let go. So number two. <coughs> this is the fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth. <coughs> Sorry, steps of Anapanasati. When you learn to experience joy as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience pleasure, sukha as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience the mental formation of piti sukha, that's joy and happiness as you breathe in and out, when you learn to calm this mental formation of pity sukha as you breathe in and out, on those occasions you are mindful of experience, vedana, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful, while being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mindful of experience, vedana. That is why on this occasion a meditator abides mindful of experience having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful, fulfilling the second satipatthana of being aware of Vedana. Now, it's some interesting points here. At this point, you are not so much mindful of the breath, you are mindful of the pleasure, the joy of the breath. When you're looking even at a person, I'm looking at David, but I'm not just looking at him, now I'm looking that his eyes are open, that particular aspect of him. So you're still looking at the breath, but you're looking at the breath in terms of its pleasure, its joy. That is the part of the breath you are experiencing. It still is the breath, sort of, but the main thing you're aware of is its joy. When you call the delightful breath, I used to call it the beautiful breath, but people said that's just too visual. Delightful breath, pleasurable breath, that is more close to <coughs> an accurate description at this stage. You're experiencing the joy and the, the pleasure. And what is that joy and pleasure? It is a chitta sankara. <coughs> it is how the mind appreciates that breath. It is, as I say, it's an important point in meditation. I keep on emphasizing it. <coughs> Sometimes I say keep on stressing it, but stress is a bad word in meditation, so I say emphasize. So just keep emphasizing that the less you do, <coughs> the more energy and happiness you have. Strange, but hopefully you've experienced some of that. Some <coughs> Sometimes beautiful um, experiences, the body feels good, the food is amazing and the, the, uh, the early morning when you come out and watch the sun come up it's just incredible, everything is just bright and beautiful, and even the tea, mmm, it's so amazing. Whatever it is, it is the fact that when you uh, stop doing so much and don't get so exhausted with your brain. Your mind has all the energy. It's aware and whatever you see is delightful. Remember that saying, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven and a wildflower, 
Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. It's just, grain of sand is ordinary, but it becomes incredibly beautiful. That's the Chitta Sankara, how the mind, energized, sees the world. So much more beautiful and happy than you'd ever expect. That's just the nature of our mind. So that's also, if ever you're tired, you're working a lot, you get grumpy. It's not a fault in you, it's not a defilement, you know, come on, put a smile on your face, you're grumpy today, it's just because you're exhausted. If you take a rest, become still, really just relax, let go, don't do anything, the energy comes up again, you get happy. Stillness <coughs> is the cause of strong mindfulness. Stillness creates happiness. It's lovely to know that. So if you want some happiness, just be still for an hour or two. Don't think. The energy has come back up again. It's really good fun, if you know how to do that. What was it? Stories. Okay, here's one story. They have to be personal stories, because otherwise it was just, you, know, you can't really sort of know them as accurate. I get myself into all sorts of interesting uh, gigs and jobs and over in Singapore, they decided to try something new in that Buddhist fellowship, which I was their patron and main <coughs> spiritual guide. They decided to do a, a play in stage in the Victoria Theatre in Singapore. And it was called Opening the Door of Your Heart. <laughs> Based on some of the stories which I wrote there, and uh, with music as well. And because there's some really sort of amazing sort of uh, uh, talent, you know, in that um, in that group. But of course, they wanted me to do a cameo in there. <laughs> so I had to also come in and perform. It was really kitschy that there was a story of like a Singapore girl who married an English man, and <laughs> and then things started going a bit difficult in their life. And then, she said, but then it all changed when I read this book by this Ang Mo. Ang Mo means like redhead, it means like a Western, Westerner. And it just had a much more positive attitude. And they said, who was that Ang Mo? It was this Ang Mo called Ajahn Brahm. And that was my cue to come on the stage. <laughs> Welcome, Ajahn <laughs> And just sit down and just give a little talk. And anyway, <laughs> it was good fun, it was cute, but it's nice. But so anyway, what I did was, um, I, know, I just had to, was it an overnight flight, or a very early morning flight to get from Perth to Singapore on a Saturday morning, have the, the matinee, just after, I think just in the afternoon, and everyone else went off for lunch, or for dinner or something, I was just stuck there, and I was really exhausted, frying and performing, and the night before doing a Friday night talk. And I said, I can't do this. <coughs> but no oomph left. And so I just found a nice quiet place to just meditate. To really get into it. And afterwards, really sort of, what do they call it in the theatre? You break a leg, you go for broke, really full energy. And I remember that because that was really worthwhile doing. Because when you get really still, you get all the energy coming back up again. And you're really flying. They wonder what I'd taken as a drug, because drugs are very dangerous in Singapore. <laughs> if you get caught with them, but they can't sort of tell that I've got a very inter internal drug called stillness. But anyway, so this is um, the Chitta Sankara. You're still the breathing, but the breath becomes delightful. It's the delight which is dominating. It's the Vedana. How you, how the mind experiences the breath with joy and happiness. And also <laughs> that when people say you're not supposed to enjoy meditation, straight away here it says, you, this is what you're supposed to do. You learn to experience joy and, and pleasure, put them all together, pleasure and joy, and <coughs> to calm, to stabilize that mental formation. On those occasions, you're mindful of experience. 
having restrained the five hindrances, energized fully aware of the purpose of mindful, for being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mindful of experience. That is why on this occasion the meditator abides mindful of experience. They're doing the second <coughs> Satipatthana. You know, when I, even when I went to Hong Kong the first couple of times, there was this wonderful nun there, very old nun, and after I'd finished you know, teaching meditation, telling a few stories, jokes, laughing, she came up to me and said, Thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm. Thank you so much for coming to Hong Kong to our temple. Before you came, I was not allowed to smile or laugh. Now you come, I can smile and laugh whenever I like. It was the case that people had the idea that monks were serious, nuns were really serious, and if you smiled, you weren't really practicing. Meditation is suffering. Suffering. <laughs> Wipe that smile off your face and meditate. <laughs> and it was like that a long time ago. I mean, I'm given, I used to go to church when I was young. The only reason was because you know, it came from a poor family. And so I told my, my dad I was going to church. What are you going to church for? I said, oh, you know, it's a good thing to go for. I never told him why. The reason why I went to the church is because I had a good singing voice. And so I was going to church to sing in the, the choir at weddings. Because at weddings, you know, you're a nice cute little 10 or 11 year old. And the people getting married, especially the bride, say, oh, isn't he cute? Isn't he nice? And they give you a tip. <laughs> it's only like five shillings or 10 shillings. That was a lot of money for a 10 year old in that day. And it was my money. I never told my father what I was doing with it. Because <laughs> I said I was just going to church. And he couldn't argue with that. <laughs> oh, that really is a, that's a, a nice little urn going to church. <laughs> but when I stopped looking cute and my voice broke, that was the end of my church day. <laughs> well, I always noticed in those churches, they were just so cold and miserable, and just, there's no cushions on the pews, there's just hard wood and stone and no heaters at all, and it was just so miserable. So, somehow or other I associated sort of many of the uh, religions as being miser misery places. It was like the equivalent of having to go to the dentist. You had to do that, <laughs> otherwise you go to hell. But it was no touch and go which was worse, going to the church or just waiting and going to hell. <laughs> it's, it's, that is no, um, please any dentists here, please it's just, you know, in those days dentists they were you know, quite sort of uh, painful. Anyway, especially when you're a small kid. So, after those uh, learned to experience joy, oh it's such a relief, you know, you can enjoy meditation. It really is nice when you get into it. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. At the same time, you're completing the second of the, the Satipatthanas. Woohoo! Having fun doing so. But you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> the joy is only starting. When you learn to experience the jitta, you're not mindful of the breath. It's just as you breathe in and out. You're still breathing, but you're focusing quite naturally on the jitter. You don't choose to focus on it. When the light comes up, you can't miss it. <coughs> what the heck is that? These are the nimittas. Why do I call the jitter the nimitta? And the reason <coughs> is, there's a wonderful saying, that this jitter, call it mind, is radiant. It's called Pabhasara jitter. When the hindrances and defilements do not affect it. And there's so many monks and uh, scholars, they give whole sort of theses on what the Prabhupada Nimitta is. But then after a while you get to this stage of the meditation, it's beautiful light and really radiant. And it's obvious that is the radiant mind. Because 
the <coughs> at this particular stage, just prior to the jhanas, your energies, your beauty is just so strong. And it is a chitta sankara. You're actually just seeing this beautiful um, light in the mind. And of course, I kept on saying to many people that you will all see that nimitta sooner or later. Christians, Muslims, everybody sees it. When you die, you go towards the light. It's exactly the same which you see, but you're alive and you stay alive. You come back afterwards and you're really alive. So it's the same thing. Why do I say that? It's because when a person dies, what happens? The five senses stop. What are you doing in meditation? Your five senses are subdued, turned off temporarily. Same thing. Only in meditation you can come back again. So, I often say that this meditation of experiencing limiters and then jhanas is actually training in how to die. Dying practice 101. <laughs> well look, you have to train to train to drive a car, you know, you have to train to get married, you have to train so many things you train for and get certificates for. And the one thing which everybody has to do, die, we don't have any training. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Tell the government, look, this is something we all have to do. We should have some courses on how to die properly. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so we experience this incredible limit. It always follows in line. You've got this beautiful uh, Piti Sukha. It gets stronger and stronger with the breath and then the delight gets dominant. So what are you watching in this stage? It's bliss, it's joy, but you, <coughs> you experience it, you perceive it as you see a light. Sometimes that, you know, you are investigated, explored, and usually afterwards, because at the time it was going to disturb it. What actually am I seeing? Why is it sometimes yellow, sometimes blue, sometimes white, sometimes brilliant, sometimes not so brilliant? Are the colours important? No, it's not important because this is how my mind makes, se <coughs> makes sense of it. This is how perception works. I have an experience and I've got this whole database of similar experiences which are from our, our five sense world. What have I experienced or seen or felt which is the closest to this nimitta business. And for me it's just really bright lights, beautiful lights. That's what's closest. For those who aren't so visual, yes, maybe you can experience it. If you're really into to, um, smells, maybe you might experience it as a, a fragrant smell, but I mean really fragrant. Or a, um, what's the other ones, sounds? That's not so uh, popular, but can happen. And also just um, her feelings. So anyway, we carry on, and that when you start to experience these things very beautiful and quiet, they're inside. So when they're inside of you, this is actually learning how to experience this jitter. It's inside. And no one else will be able to hear that sound or smell that fragrance because it's mind-made. And when you go inside of that, that 
First of all, many people, they do get afraid. When they get afraid of these things, or excited, you will find those details in what we call the Upakalesa Sutta, about the, what is it called, the hindrances, the, the obstacles to developing those nimittas. And how do you develop them? The next two is the, um, where's it gone? Experience the nimitta. When you learn to brighten the nimitta, in other words, bring joy to the nimitta, and then you learn how to um, settle the nimitta. The word for settle the nimitta, samadhaṁ, chitang. Sometimes before you call it ka, but settling is a much better word. In other words, you've got a very powerful light inside of you, and you need to actually to even make it more bright, bring joy and happiness to it, and also to settle it down, to calm it. Now when you go to nimitas, uh, especially the visual ones, I always say that they are much more reliable and also you know, easier to work with. So sometimes you can see a very, what's it called, a complex nimitta, a whole scene. It's still a nimitta, but in order to uh, bring joy to it, we always try and find the most beautiful part of it. So an example of that, I remember one nimitta which I saw, <coughs> like a, a beautiful scenery, uh, rolling hills, water, uh, trees, bushes, flowers. But then I saw on one of those trees, there was a dewdrop sparkling in the sunshine. If you see anything like that, that's the one to focus on. Actually, you don't really need to do it, it just attracts the mind, a little sparkle. And you go into that, it draws you in. And just like nowadays we have the simile of zooming in on Google Maps, you zoom in on that sparkle. So that sparkle just takes up the whole of your <coughs> mind field. And because it takes up like, you know, just like the visual mind, no, it's not visual, but you know, the mind interpreted as a visual scene, then all of the complexity disappears and you've got this beautiful star in your mind. And you know, that's how you somehow, sometimes, bring joy to that nimitta. You brighten it up, it gets brighter, not just the scenery, which is nice colours, but this is getting brighter and more intense and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. No need to worry at all, because you're going to be fine. It's not going to harm you at all. And it becomes happier and happier and happier. But however, that when you do have these limiters, they get happier and happier and happier, brighter and more wonderful, sometimes they can be uh, disturbing, just too much for you. And the one simile, it's actually two similes to do with nimittas, which I found incredibly helpful. One was from great master Ajahn Chah, you know, who gave the story of the still forest pool. Now the still forest pool most people know from Paul Brighter's simile, but that's not how I heard it. How I heard that simile was that Ajahn Chah would go wandering through the um, forests of Thailand, and then I did that as well later on, but you know, not as dense jungles, but still some jungles. And you would try and find a river or a lake uh, about two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, because you'd have to wash. I remember going about three days without washing on arms around once, and you felt so stinky and smelly and, and really uncomfortable, because you were walking, it was hot weather. So anyway, you, know, you always try and find somewhere where you can bathe and you filter some water, maybe wash a few robes, and then you set up your mosquito net, always about 15, 20 meters away from the side of the lake or river. Because you'd have to uh, uh, stay there at night. And if you went too close to the lake, you'd have the animals coming out in the evening, and they may sort of disturb or harm you. 
So you always have been away. And Ajahn Chah would actually say that many times he'd keep his eyes open and just watch the animals come out to play. I remember going to one place over in the north of Thailand many years ago and on my own in this big monastery, it was really close to the Burmese border, so <coughs> real wilderness area. And in the hot season I put a little bowl out for the, the birds to drink. It's a water bowl. And then it took one or two days to find it. And there was a, a, like a knot in a plank of wood where I would be inside my hut and I would look through that little spy hole to actually look at the birds as they were drinking and, and bathing in the evening. It was wonderful, um, what's it called, <coughs> entertainment, watching animals in the wild, especially in the remote part. But I remember one thing which I never ever expected, was there was birds of so many different species, big ones, small ones, I didn't know the species, this was jungle and there's so many of them, they all found out where it was. And in the evening, a certain time, they came to take a drink and to bathe. They formed a queue, a line, big bird, small bird, all birds, and they were a whole line there for and it was just so cute. And they would be very patient, they would wait for the one in front to drink, to wash, you know, see the birds in the bird bath, just they wash their wings and just splash around, uh, splash around, and then that one would fly away, the next one would come in. They were just so orderly. Now, I lived in China for nine years, if that was a Thai bus stop, human beings, I'm sorry, but they, <laughs> they would not queue, queue, queue so orderly. But the birds did. But of course there was always, and I was always waiting for this, there'd always be one bird come in the evening. You know, a really narcissist, big shot, I don't need to queue. And he would jump the queue. I don't know why I said he. <laughs> <laughs> would jump the queue and try to bathe first. And all the other birds would come out of the queue, jump on this queue jumper, peck him and drive him away. And then after they'd driven this, this, this um, scallywag away, they'd all get in the queue again, exactly as they were before. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing there. It was amazing what animals could do. And they were all different species. No one taught them this, they hadn't gone to school. <coughs> They were just natural, natural cue formers. Amazing how animals will organise themselves. But anyway, um, so in this time that Ajahn Chah, he would watch the animals come out to drink and to wash and to play in the evening. And he said that he had to be very still. Because if he moved, the animals would know he was there. And they would run away. He would know they were thirsty and hot they wouldn't come out to drink, because animals were scared of humans. And he said he had to be very peaceful, very still, and then the animals would come out, check, and they wouldn't think that anyone was watching. And then they'd come out with their young, their cubs, whatever, and they would play in the pool. He said it was such wonderful entertainment at night, animals in the jungle, never sort of been trained, just wild, just playing around, splashing each other, and then they would go. But then he said, this was a crucial part of the story, after the ordinary animals had come and bathed and played and gone back, these other animals would come out like he'd never seen before. No one ever told him such animals had existed. They were beautiful, wonderful to look at but incredibly shy. If they knew that someone was watching them, they would run back into the bush and never come out for days. He said, those are the nimittas and the jhanas. Really shy mind states. Nimittas which come out to play by your still forest pool. <coughs> a lake is a, just a, such a common uh, archetype for the mind. They only come out to play when you're really still. And I remember that simile when I was meditating. Beautiful nimitta would come out. Sometimes, you'd experience it, sometimes it comes out 
in the corner. And sometimes stupid Ajahn Brahm would go looking for it and it would run away. It was no I was watching it. Sometimes it just comes up and peeks. Is anyone there? And if I perfectly still don't move, then it comes and centers. We have a wonderful time together. Don't move. Be like an Ajahn Chah. Don't say anything. Wow. Oh. Fear and excitement are the two obstacles. You have to keep still, keep cool. How can you do that? It's natural. These are big states. How can you stop being afraid or being excited? And I'm going to introduce now this uh, programming your mindfulness. Sometimes that I remembered that and said, I've got to be still. You made a noise, it's gone. Sometimes they say, keep quiet. <laughs> they know. So, simple things. When I am in a, you know, a, a good groove in meditation, I know that limiters are very likely to happen. At the beginning of the meditation, I resolve, make a resolution. If some limiters come up, I will not be afraid. Limiters come up, I will not be afraid. Limiters come up, I will not be afraid. I tell myself that three times, paying full attention, then I forget it. If it is uh, not fear, but excitement comes up, wow, if the limiter arises, I will not be excited. I repeat it three times in my own words, and it is an antivirus. It's amazing to see how it works. Because the beautiful and powerful limiter comes up and usually I'd be scared or afraid or wow. And then I'm about to say wow and it stops. The antivirus kicks in. The programming works. So I can't say those things at that time. I say them first, implant them in my mind. <coughs> when it comes to the point of limiters, I've done the work. Put the, put the program in, and it's subverbal, it doesn't interfere with the progress. And then beautiful limiters are there. So if you have any problem at that time in the meditation, that is very, very sensitive. If you try and say anything, or do anything, or move at all, meditation is bust. So you have to keep silent, and you give the instructions way before. So this is actually how you enjoy it. Oh, the limiters get really beautiful. And how you stabilize them, keep them still. They move. So I remember for, oh, I don't know how long it was, I was having trouble with these limiters. They were just, I couldn't keep them still. They were bright, they didn't go anywhere. They were there, but they were just moving, shaking. And the solution for me <coughs> was an interesting one. But I was getting a bit frustrated, and I was like a monk has to do, having a sh shave in the morning, in front of the mirror. And then I saw the mirror, the, the guy in the mirror was moving. And then, just because I knew what the problem was, but anyway, I tried to hold the mirror still, because the guy in the mirror was moving. And of course, the guy in the mirror still kept on moving. It was the, the image which was the problem. The one who was watching was a problem. So, that's why the next time I had a limiter was moving, I just imagined that I was the person watching this, and I kept still. The one watching, the one observing, the one knowing. And then of course the limiter stopped moving. Instead of trying to catch the image and keep the image still, the one watching, keep that still. And then of course the limiter just freezes. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's how we do this. Um, and you learn to settle the limiter, still the limiter, and bring joy to the limiter. Bring it energy. <coughs> and then the fourth step, then you liberate the chitta. We're mochaya, tang chitta. And sometimes you need to know your pali. Because every time they use the word Vimochaya, 
and every time they use the related noun Vimoka. The Vimoka always means the jhanas. So, <coughs> you actually understand what this means according to the Pali. Sometimes, if you try and translate it literally, you miss the meaning. But when you uh, read these things for yourself again, 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 you get what the meaning is. Remoka is freedom. Not any type of freedom. We have the eight Remokas, all jhanas and arupas. So this is where you enter the jhana. The jhana is the twelfth stage of Anapanasati. And anyway, on those occasions, when you learn, you learn to enter the jhana, the way the chit which you breathe in and out, on those occasions you are mindful of the jitta, having restrained the five hindrances, energized fully aware of the purpose of mindfulness. Mindful. The Buddha is saying, I do not say that there is a development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is dark who is not fully aware. <coughs> the fully aware is reaching the jhana when the hindrances are gone. That is why on that occasion the meditator abides mindful of the mind, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose of mindful. You just got the jitter here, the mind and nothing else. So this is fully aware. Sometimes people say, oh, just when you have a jhana, you're not aware at all. And in fact, you just look at the text there, this is where awareness gets super aware. And the highest awareness, the purity and power of mindfulness reaches its peak of the fourth jhana. But not the awareness which you usually experience, an awareness which is still. Well, you cannot examine. There used to be a little quiz program when I was a kid, where at the end of the quiz program they'd get an ordinary object, like a pencil, and put a still photograph of it from an unusual angle. And I remember just one, because it was a sharpened pencil, a little black um, circle in the center, and then white, and then red on the outside. But like a, a target, like a bullseye. And you're asked to sort of find out, what actually is this? And, you know, from that, I couldn't get it. And afterwards, oh yeah, when you move it around, you can actually get it. You need to have different perspectives to be able to see something and understand it. If something is very still, at that time, you can't really know what it is. You're aware. But the quality of knowing, of uh, discriminating, seeing it from two different angles, is gone. That's why the experience of the jhanas are weird knowings. You can't move. Fully aware. You can't take something and look at it this way or that way. So, afterwards, that's why you can never get insight within jhanas. And when people say that, they say, well, they're, they're useless then. You can't get inside with your jhanas, you can't get enlightened when you're in jhanas. Correct. <laughs> but you can't get enlightened without the jhanas. So what you do is afterwards when you come out, these are powerful experiences, so powerful you can't forget them. Really huge imprints on your, your mind. So we have something which is called Pacha Awakening Yana, the reflecting knowledge. You can actually see them. Remember them, experience them. And that's where you find out what they are, what was missing, how powerful they were. And that's one of the things which is missing, even in the first jhana, discriminating thought. The ability to analyse. The analysis comes later, when you're out. But it's also, you've got a powerful mind afterwards. Five images are gone. So, Four, when you learn to explore impermanence in breath meditation. <coughs> this is the last uh, four facts of Anapanasati. When you learn to explore things ceasing in breath meditation. When you learn to explore relinquishing things in breath meditation. Well, I'll miss one out. Impermanence, fading away, uh, ceasing and relinquishing in breath meditation. On those occasions you're mindful of mind objects, the Dharma, Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose of mindful, having seen with wisdom the impermanence, fading away, and cessation, and relinquishment of even the five hindrances, you are mindful with equanimity. You really are mindful now, without wanting 
to see what you want to see and without being in denial whatever's there you see with that with that community that is why on that occasion of mindfulness of mind objects that was very trifling and energized fully aware of the purpose of mindful now of those four things impermanence fading away ceasing relinquishing things the second one is sometimes translated as dispassion. There are people understand there's two possibilities for Viraka, but it's quite obvious in this context it does mean not dispassion. Dispassion has happened a long time ago. This is things fading away. Impermanence. Impermanence doesn't mean rise and fall. Impermanence is like you are sitting down by a lake, just watching the waves up and down on the lake. That's not really impermanence. Impermanence is when the whole lake vanishes. It's gone. Together with the, the ground which contained it and the sky above it. Impermanence which gets you enlightened is not ordinary. It literally turns you upside down. Things which shouldn't vanish, do vanish. Things like the, uh, <coughs> the tadpole. What the heck is this? There's no water. Where did that go? It's not supposed to go. There's no warranty. <laughs> so that's ceasing, fading away, things going slowly. There's that wonderful simile which I wrote of the, uh, from Alice in Wonderland of the Cheshire Cat. And I always misquote some of it, I think I don't even know if it's Alice in Wonderland or Alice with a looking glass, but it's a wonderful simile. Of Alice saw this Cheshire Cat on a tree and it kept on vanishing and reappearing, vanishing and reappearing. And Alice said something like, all this coming and going, it just really gives me a headache. You know, can't you just sort of, uh, you know, just stay or go or something like that? And the Cheshire Cat said, okay, I will just vanish slowly for you. And so the Cheshire Cat vanished gently and slowly. I think it was just the head, so first the ears vanished. And then the, the whiskers vanished. And then, what else? <coughs> vanished, the head vanished. Leaving only the, the, the lips smiling. And then the mouth vanished until leaving only the smile without a head to do any smiling and of which Alice said, and I remember this quote accurately this is so curious it gets curiouser and curiouser and curiouser I've often seen a cat without a smile this is the first time I've seen a smile without a cat <laughs> very beautiful English and I, when I read that and started getting into deep meditation I thought, wow, what a beautiful simile that is. You have the happiness. You don't have anything on which the happiness is drawn. Never is joy. Without a body. Without even a mind. To have happiness with life. Not as you know it anyway. So, uh, that is how the jhanas happen. Anicca things disappear, which are not supposed to disappear, like water for the, the tadpole and other kind of stuff <coughs> from. Knowing things actually fade away and they cease. And relinquishing, once you know these things, they can just go without your permission. Of course, you realize you don't own them. They're not yours. You relinquish. So those are. The four Satipatthanas, and because of that, you develop the seven enlightened factors and become a monk. I'm sure I've got over time. Oh no, it's just the one time. It's now five o'clock. Amazing. Good time. So now I am going to become impermanent. I'm going to fade away. I am <laughs> going to uh, cease sitting here, and I am going to disappear. Really much. So. <laughs>